evening. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's good to see you in Baragam, which is the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. And good evening, it's fantastic to see you here this evening. My name is Vicky McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland, your State Library. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of my colleagues to Legacy Reflections on Mabo Exhibition. But let me begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and their continuing connection to land and as, and as custodians of stories for millennia. We are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our facilitator, Kate O'Hara, who is the director of Umbrella Studio Contemporary Arts, and our panelists, Gail Marbo, Judy Watson, and Katina Davidson. So welcome to you all. Thirty years ago, the High Court made an historic ruling that not only changed the lives of mere islanders, but also helped correct the history books. The inimitable Eddie Marbo led this change, and tonight we honour and explore his legacy through an artist's lens. To mark the 30th anniversary of the landmark Marbo decision, State Library is proudly hosting a series of events that further our understanding of this pivotal moment in Australia's history. As a cultural institution, we are always seeking to provide opportunities to build on these moments, acknowledging the past and embracing a more inclusive future that further enriches our identity as Queenslanders and as Australians. The travelling exhibition Legacy Reflections on Marbo helps us to do this. Co-curated by Gail Marbo, Dr Jonathan McBurney and Kelly Williams, this exhibition brings together First Nations and non-Indigenous artists in the spirit of reconciliation. Each artist has responded to an aspect of Eddie Marbo, his life, politics, activism or legacy. Tonight you will hear from Gail Marbo, Eddie's daughter, as well as contributing artists Judy and Katina, who will share their deep personal responses to Marbo. For those of you here at State Library, I invite you to stay after the discussion and explore the exhibition in our Philip Bacon Heritage Gallery on Level 4. You can also pick up your own copy of the exhibition catalogue at our pop-up library shop just outside. For those of you who are joining us online, you can go to State Library's website to explore the Marbo legacy. And you'll also find a link to the um, online shop and you can also purchase a copy of the catalogue online as well. So I do hope that you enjoy tonight's discussion and um, please welcome Kate to do the introductions. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, thank you Vicky. Um, welcome and thanks for joining us, everybody, um, both in person and online tonight for this talk. Um, first, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the countries um, that we are gathered on this evening for this panel discussion, both in person and online. Um, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Um, so I'm quite grateful to be here tonight, um, just reflecting on the um, Legacy Reflections on Mabo Tour. It started in 2019 and it started, um, we launched it in Townsville just after a monsoonal event. Um, so <laughs> Umbrella was um, homeless at the time. We had to find a pop-up space to launch it yep. and then... Uh, in the following year, the, the pandemic happened, so <laughs> we negotiated that over the last couple of years with the incredible team at Museum and Galleries Queensland who have partnered with us and our venues. And then just prior to the launch here, you guys had the um, flooding event. So that's two natural disasters and one <laughs> pandemic. So I'm very great, grateful to be here. Um, and I'm also really pleased that it's at the State Library of Queensland um, for the 30th anniversary of the Marbo decision, so important, um, and to be able to reach a bigger audience. Um, and the other reason that I'm really pleased to be here is um, because it's the first time we've been able to bring Gail, Judy and Katina together to talk about this exhibition and the work that was created. Um, so first of all, uh, I might introduce our, um, our panellists, sorry. So Gail Marbo is a multidisciplinary artist who works across sculpture, installation, printmaking and painting. Most recently, Gail has been experimenting with cast bronze work empowered by her residency at uh, Urban Art Projects in 2021. 
Uh, her work often connects Torres Strait Islander knowledge and political histories, including that of her own family, manifesting contemporary advocacy. Storytelling and sharing culture are, are an important part of her work. And as you can see from the co-creation, curation of this exhibition, Legacy Reflections on Marbo, which premiered in Townsville in tw uh, 2019. Um, her recent uh, personal exhibition, House of Cards, opened last year at Umbrella Studio Contemporary Arts. Um, and again, mined her personal and emotional archive to speak to the socio-political climate of three generations of powerful Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Um, uh, and we're very pleased that it will be touring to Ro the Rockhampton Museum of Art alongside Legacy later in the year. Uh, so Gail's work is held in numerous collections around the country. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for being here with us, Gail. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Judy uh, was born in Mundubbera. Am I pronouncing that right? Sorry, in Queensland. <laughs> Uh, Judy's Aboriginal mater uh, matrilineal family is from Wayani country in northwest West Queen Wanyi. 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 Thank you. <laughs> um, in northwest Queen Queensland. Um, the artist's process uh, evolves by working from sight and memory, revealing Indigenous histories following lines of emotional and physical topography that centre on particular places and moments in time. Spanning painting, printmaking, drawing, sculpture and video, her practice often draws on archival documents and materials such as maps, letters, police reports to unveil institutionalised discrimination against Aboriginal people. Including, um, sorry, beg your pardon. Uh, her work is in several uh, significant Austra Australian and international collections, including all of the Australia's, Australia's state institutions, the National Gallery of Australia, uh, the Tokyo National University of Technology, the Taipei Fine Arts Museum, the British Museum and in the new uh, MCA and Tate uh, Collection Partnership. Um, uh, so I want to thank uh, Judy for joining us tonight. Uh, Katina Davidson, welcome. Um, Katina is an artist, writer, and the Curator of Indigenous Australian Art at the Queensland Art Gallery, um, Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. Uh, her creative practice aims to draw attention to little known local histories, especially in relation to her Indigenous communities and family. She has been um, part of uh, many group exhibitions, including Legacy, um, and uh, recently the Vibrant Laneways exhibition curated by Blacklash Collective in 2018. Uh, Gathering Strands, curated by Freya Carmichael at Redlands Art Gallery uh, in 2016 and participated in the South Stradbroke Island Indigenous Art Camp run by the City of Gold Coast in 2014, where she returned in 2021 as a writer in residence um, uh, at its new location in the Gold Coast hinterland. So welcome, Katina, and thank you. Such um, incredible artists and women, so it's hard not to have long biographies. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off um, with Gail and the origin of, of the exhibition, the concept, where you were, how the idea came about. Um, yeah, hand over to you. Okay, so 25th anniversary, I've got an exhibition in Cairns. I'm standing there with uh, Jonathan McBurney, the director of Umbrella at the time, and I said, Jonathan, as a non-Indigenous artist, what, what, to, what does Mabo mean to you? And he sort of went into this little spiel, and I said, this is interesting because one of the things is that I know what it means, and I know what it means to Indigenous Australia, but what does it mean to non-Indigenous peoples? And I said, would it be interesting to actually have an exhibition to pull people together, to let them have their voice to say what Mabo means to them. And for me to, to do that was like, well, this is part of you know, that reconciliation statement. So if we do this and people come together to do this as a collaborative, it's that whole thing of like, we're changing the narrative of group exhibitions and giving it, you know, 
because Mabo is, is big in, in, in many fields because the way the artists looked at it and they interpreted, it fell into categories and it was like, well, okay, it found its own form. And so then with that, that's where when we looked at all the works and how brilliantly they, they were because, you know, Judy's work, that was the first one I saw when I walked into the room and I went like, what the <laughs> hell? Because I remember seeing it as a, as a concept, but then to seeing it on the wall, it was just like, wow, mind-blowing. Then I went like, okay, if that's doing that to me, what, everything, what is everything else going to do? Because I made it a point of not going into them installing I wanted to be there on the opening night because of the fact that I wanted to be like everybody else when they walked in the door. Just mm -hmm. mind-blowing moment. And for me, that's what it was. And just having those, those pieces in the room that people connected to and people, you know, were like, this is interesting. And, and people themselves sort of just, you know, they looked at it and were like, well, this is a really good way of looking at it. And, and I remember um, Kelly telling me, oh no, sorry, Alan telling me that a guy got off the bus in Townsville, walked into the gallery to have a look and see what this was, this Marbo thing, what is that? Mm -hmm. Walks in and he's looking, he goes, I remember meeting a man, Marbo, he was a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> he was, a, is, is, he goes, and they said, yeah, that's him. They were like, what? <laughs> he, he, but he was the gardener. But that was, it was interesting to, to get people, you know, and then, then him reflecting on some of the things that that he remembered th th during that time. And so, yeah, people found connections with this exhibition in their own way. Mm. And for me, that was, uh, that was a great journey to, to be on. And then for it to tour now, was it four years? That's like, whoa. <laughs> I don't think there's any, any other exhibitions that have done that, especially a, a big group exhibition like this. So for me, it's like, it's, you know, it speaks volumes in itself when you see the works. And then, you know, just to stand there and read what the artists into and how they've interpreted things. Mm -hmm. For me, it's wonderful. There's so, yeah. definitely been a big appetite for it and different mm -hmm. kind of responses um, by having all those different voices yep. in the exhibition. Um, to, to begin the process with the artists, um, you shared a personal family archive um, about your father, which wasn't just necessarily about his political work and his advocacy work. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? I know that you're, you're keeping that um, just uh, with the artists, but perhaps revealing a little bit about what they might have been able and to so, access. And um, so with what Kate's saying is, the information I had at home that were, was part of my mum's papers and things, she sort of said, yeah, well, I've got this and I've got that. And so it was like opening all of those and letting the artists look at them, taking photographs of the information, having it online, so they could read and absorb the things that we had in our own own collection. And also looking at, at um, well, we, we did a video. We went up to Murray Island, Kate, myself, my son, and a, and a filmmaker. We went up there and we walked the island and we just, it was just a casual conversation with my son and I and just pointing out different things on the islands and just because the artists couldn't go there, we went there and we walked it and, and talked about it and then then shared that with, you know, the, um, the artists themselves. And for me, it was that whole thing of like, if they could be here and just see things, because I know s some artists ask for specific things. You know, they wanted to know if there was imagery of, of specific things, and I said, well, there's not. But, you know, when we go up, maybe I could show you some of the, the boundary markers. Mm. Because I know just at last there was a couple of boundary markers which were rocks. And, um, but, you know, I'm a girl, so I had to get my son to <laughs> clear it because the rocks themselves, they really, they, it, was, it was that thing of where the rocks were. For my son to pick it up, it was nothing. For me to try and pick it up, it was really heavy. So I went like, okay, I'll stand back. I know I'm not to pick it up. Mm -hmm. So I'll let my son do this. But he just picked it up, looked at it, and put it straight back where it was. And, um, and so it was just those sort of that those sort of things to show that connection to that space. 
and then that with what people could take away from that was their own interpretation. As one of the artists did was she looked at the, um, the documentary, you know, the, the um, Life of an Isle of Man. They re-looked re -looked at those and they looked at and they took away information from that too. So all of those, all of those bits all came together to make up the catalogue of, of information that they could use towards the exhibition. Mm. Thanks, Gail. Um, might actually now um, talk to Judy about how she responded to that, um, what was provided by Gail and more broadly um, to the Marbo legacy. Sure. Is it possible to look at the slide of my work? Yes, up there. Oh, it's up there? Oh, OK, yeah, there. cool. <laughs> yeah, great. So the research part of making any of these works is really important for me and really interesting. And I did actually meet your dad uh, down in Brisbane one time with uh, my friend Rowan Silver. They were working on the case together. Mm -hmm. And I've stopped in at Murray Island when I was working there when I was working with artists from um, one of the other islands and I remember looking down and seeing the, the particular shape of the fish traps. Mm. And I also felt, having uh, done some work as part, part of a group of artists working at the British Museum, seeing a lot of the work that Alfred Haddon had because that was going to be part of the show which was on there. And even though I wasn't responding to that, I just have that memory of all of the things that uh, they were looking at for that particular exhibition, uh, defying in, not defying empire, I can't remember what, enduring civilization that um, Gay Sculthorpe, Tasmanian Aboriginal anthropologist, um, working at the British Museum, put together. And I had all these other ideas I wanted to work with, but then there was something about that map that really drew me in, the Haddon map, and also what the actual island, the map of the island looks like. And you can see that they don't quite fit. And I think that's the whole thing is, and I was just reading up then about um, Haddon and about how he came into his line of work through zoology and biology, things like that. And then he, just a very interesting way that he sort of came into it and you know, sort of what his family life was. And then just to sort of see, I imagined the island, the two, forms almost be, being like stone tools grinding together. So you can see the, the map at the bottom and I've got the, the brownish one behind with like the red ochre and I've got the water lines going through from the creeks, etc. And then there's Haddon's map, which it's like when you look at uh, the Matthew Flinders map ac according to what is there now. It's, um, it's an imagined, you know, cartography, an imagined drawing, but it's also drawing upon what he's learned from people he's spoken to. So it's a translation from his perspective of an Indigenous uh, methodology and, in, you know, in really important scientific information, but it's also, it belongs to, you know, the community. Mm. And so I just sort of think it was interesting to look at those. I had been doing some work with resistance pins, I call them, those forms at the bottom, which are... <coughs> Forms that are made of their utensils, uh, which are made out of bone, or the one in the middle is actually from cow and yama, and it's used to prise apart pandanus, um, you know, the pandanus, all the different seeds, and it's used specifically for that. Uh, you know, there's things that are put through the nose or put through the ear, and basically you wear your tools on your body. And I think most uh, civilizations around the world, not just indigenous, had this as part of the um, cultural memory, but certainly within Australia um, and you know the Torres Strait, these are things that are there. And then the baler shell at the bottom, I do remember seeing um, uh, there were baler shell and conch shell from um, the Torres Strait that had been collected, and I, the baler shell is something that is important within our family and within all of Aboriginal Australia too because the, the baler shell was often uh, traded along the trade routes and you find the, the baler shell uh, at a lot of places where there is wells, inland wells or anything else as a drinking vessel. It's used for putting ochre in, for painting up the ceremony and I see it as a connection to my 
Indigenous um, mat matrilineal family, one year people. So my grandmother, you know, mother, grandmother, great grandmother, etc. So it's a, following a line through. And I also was aware that you were sharing so much with us of your father and of his memory, but also his strong stance and incredible imprint upon our nation and around the world. Um, and it was a real privilege to be making work in connection with that. So thank you. Thank you, G. What was your reaction? I think you said that was the first work you saw when yeah, you entered the exhibition. Yeah. But, but yeah, but that's that's interesting, you know, how you, <clears throat> the way you've interpreted, you know, and, and done that, and yeah, brilliant work, so yes. But you also said you had a connection to um, the Haddon map as well, and you mm. s and we just looked at the T-shirt that that's your right. mother printed. Because, and, and a lot of the, a lot of the um, Torres Strait Islanders actually use that map when they're, they're putting on the shirts to celebrate Marble Day because mm. it's that thing of it's it's connection. Yeah. You know, it's connection and it's boundaries and it's, you know, it's just Murray Allen. Mm. So Mayor, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I, I need to remind people, let people know that you can actually, we'll have a um, question and answer session at the end. Um, so you can register your questions through the um, slido.com uh, website, hashtag SLQ Marbo Legacy. Um, just, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll collect them there and um, choose some at the end to answer. Um, so, I actually now wanted to talk to Katina. Um, how did the curatorial premise re res resonate with you? Um, how did you respond to the family archive that Gail shared? Um, like Judy said, what you shared with us about your family was so personal and so beautiful and I've, I suppose in my artistic practice, but also um, just, you know, the community that I'm in, uh, you know, always being told to not tell stories that belong to other people. So um, I was actually really anxious when I got the email and the phone call from Jonathan <laughs> to say, do you want to be part of this show? And I was like, well, that's not, you know, that's got yeah. nothing to do with me or my family or, you know, my mob or anything like that. And he, he was like, no, it's okay. Well, and, you know, kind of went on to explain the premise of the show. Um, so I really looked at that the legacy aspect of it and decided to take a more um, personal direction um, because I, yeah, I didn't want to feel like I was overstepping and I know that's just on me and, you know, could have had conversations around it. Um, but I, uh, yeah, so those, those are my paintings which are hundreds of times the size of real life. They're only very, very small. <laughs> um, literally 10 by 13 centimetres big. Um, but I, I decided to, um, I suppose I was really inspired, as we all are, by the legacy of the activism of native title and um, also the, the photographs and the photographic collection that you shared with us and, you know, being able to look back at, at these memories and, you know, we don't, in my family, like there aren't a whole lot of photographs um, that were printed and, um, you know, when I do find these little gems, I just get really attached to them. Um, and so I decided to create this series called Sites of Resistance that um, kind of look at a, a more localised um, Brisbane story of um, the influence of that legacy of, um, of political movement, political activism, um, by Indigenous communities, which is happening across the country um, and really was put into the, the limelight on national levels um, because of, you know, the work of your father and other people in communities as well. Um, so these works are... Um, and the top left is my grandmother, Georgina Margaret Thompson, OAM, um, and she's holding her Order of Australia medal that was given to her in 1985 for... Um, services to the Aboriginal community. Um, so her and my grandfather, who is um, the man below her, um, they ran a number of hostels in the 70s and 80s in Brisbane for um, Indigenous community members who, you know, if you had to come into Brisbane, needed somewhere to stay, um, you know, to go to the hospital or appointments or anything like that, to have somewhere to be able to go that was welcoming, um, because we know at the time um, Indigenous people weren't welcome in a lot of places. Um, 
and and so that's um, kind of depicted in the the image on the top right, which is the corner of Trinity Lane and Wollongabba, which is the road that um, those hostels used to be in. Um, the houses are no longer there. Um, I did, um, you know, try and look up um, um, images of the houses through the State Library collection and those, um, I can't remember the name, but the, the big photographic collection of the, the man who, pardon? Corley. Corley, Corley. Yes, and unfortunately um, <laughs> those houses weren't in, in that, but, um, you know, looking into those kind of archival um, um, evidences of um, different sites. Um, and so that's kind of a, a memento or a memory of, of that area. Um, and then below that on the bottom right is the hostel um, on um, Wynnum Road in Morningside that's named after my grandmother for those services. And so that hostel's still running. It's an aged care facility for um, Indigenous people um, in Brisbane to go and, um, you know, be part of community when you're um, needing these services because we know that um, people who are affected by dementia or, or anything, um, it's better um, for everyone's welfare if you're with your community and um, in this, you know, safe space. Um, so those are, yeah, kind of the stories behind those and um, just this idea of memory as well. So ever since I was, you know, really little, um, driving into Brisbane City, um, would always be reminded my reminded by dad like you know these important sites of our own activism and um, you know mentioning all of the other community names um, and members who are also part of that and just that reiteration of um, the strength and the legacy of um, each of our communities yeah. um, you were saying earlier before we started that um, your father was up in Townsville for a period or was it your grandfather? Granddad, yeah. yeah. Granddad was living up in Townsville for a while. Yeah, I wonder yeah. if there was some crossover yeah, <laughs> in the probably. networks, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, uh, you made some really deliberate choices about your materials in this work yeah. and the scale. Can you talk to us about the rationale behind oh, that? Sure, sure. Um, oh, one thing I did forget to mention about um, Granddad, um, so... He was also, and my grandmother and other Brisbane community members were also part of the establishment of legal services and health services and housing services in Brisbane. And so it's also, um, you know, acknowledging all of those kind of community members. Um, in terms of materials, um, these are actually extremely small um, oil paintings. So like I mentioned, they're um, 10 centimetres high by 13 centimetres wide. Um, and they've been um, painted onto blocks of porcelain. Um, and so I like this idea of, um, you know, they're roughly photograph size. Um, so looking back at the family album, um, they're also a similar size to postcards. Um, they're also a similar size to um, like a building block or a tile. And so this idea about um, if you think, you know, conceptually about the building blocks of society. Um, mm. They're also like these small memorial tiles as well. Um, and, um, yeah, that's all I can think of at the moment in terms of materials. They look so beautiful up in the, um, in the gallery because the, mm. the lighting is just mm. divine and they Thank draw you. you in. And particularly, yeah, the scale just works so beautifully. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you a little bit more about your grandfather because I understand yeah. <laughs> like he was a huge figure um, yeah. in, in his work here. Yeah, yeah, can you tell us about that? Um, I mean, which, <laughs> which, which part work? of it? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, him along with, like, you know, I always want to acknowledge every other community member yeah. because there are so many people. It's not just this one person, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, he was kind of, part of the Brisbane Tribal Council back in the day, often um, uh, newspapers or television crews would kind of go to him for comment on certain issues. So, um, you know, there is a lot of um, publicly available research which is available on him. So he passed away when I was only a small child. Um, so I didn't get to know him as an adult or even a teenager. Um, but just these, you know, memories and um, and the the radical activism as well 
um, when I did the Night by the Fire last week, I brought a book by Paul Richards with me to show, and I don't have it here today, but it's, it's called Adventures with Agitators. Mm -hmm. um, so Paul Richards um, uh, is a retired barrister who, who worked with the um, founding the Aboriginal Legal Service and a number of other kind of organisations um, with, you know, Grandad and um, other community members. Um, and he, you know, documents these wild stories about going up and down um, the coast of Queensland and um, the kind of things that they would have to do in order to, you know, get legislation changed or um, even just, you know, basic human rights to be adhered to. Huge work, yeah. huge work. Um, I guess it's kind of a nice segue to go back to Gail in that um, mm. uh, Gail recently donated um, a collection of T-shirts made by her mother, um, uh, Dr Benita Marbo OIM. Um, and uh, I guess sometimes her work's been a bit overshadowed by um, the, the towering figure of Eddie's work. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, Benita's work um, and her advocacy and activism, um, particularly because this a, a selection mm. of the T-shirts are actually um, uh, exhibited alongside Legacy here at the State Library now. Yeah, so the T-shirts came to me after Mum's passing because my siblings sort of sorted things out and they sort of went like, here, Gail, you have these. And I went like, what? I've got like 12 boxes. What are in these boxes? And they said, have a look. So they all went home and I'm left with these 12 boxes. So I started going through them because I knew they were mum things and, you know, just losing her and it was like, do I want to open up those boxes yet? Wait for a little bit of time. <laughs> and then I got, a friend came to visit me in my house and they said, oh, you got those t-shirts that your mum used to do or that one that, so in this collection here, this one over here, she said, he, they said, you got that shirt that, you know, you did to take to Murray Island when you went with um, Tony Abbott. And I said, yeah, well, I, I needed to brand my shirt up and put my father's face on to remind him where he was. Because, <laughs> you know, sometimes, you know, they forget. Because they get caught up in the moment. So, um, and I said, yeah, and I said, well, I've got some other, other works too. I said, I've got all my mum's shirts. From the first shirt that she did, she, she went and got, you know, the ink layered photograph that you can go to and they sort of put it onto a T-shirt. She got one of those done of Dad sitting at a festival and that was her first ever shirt that she she did for Dad to, you know, and on it was she put, I'm proud of you, my darling. Mm -hmm. And then I, every year after that she decided that she was going to make her own screens, screen print her own shirts for her children and her grandchildren. And I said, Mum, you know you've got 30 grandkids. She goes, yeah. And then I said, you know they're all different sizes. They're all not the same size. And she goes, that's OK. I'll do it. So you walk into a house and you get overwhelmed with the smell of um, screen print ink because over each chair every, there's, no, there's no space because the T-shirts are all laid out with paper in it and you sort of walk in and go, can we sit down somewhere? She goes, oh, no, 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 they're all wet. Sit, let's go outside and have a cup of tea. So um, every year she would do one and she would ring and say, what size now? <laughs> what size, you know, what size do we need to do? And then she, and then, but for me, it was that thing of just getting, just receiving a shirt from her was like, yep, here's your shirt, here's your <laughs> shirt. Okay, everyone put your shirts on, now. we're all going to be same. Same, same, a little bit different, but yeah. But the boys had a pocket at the front, the girls didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that was for cigarettes, you know, right. just in case they smoked. <laughs> and I went like, no, 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 we should be all safe. But it was, it was when, um, so we did Dad's tombstone unveiling, that we all stood proudly with our shirts on, and there's pictures of my older brother holding my second son's hand, walking down the main street of Townsville to what was then the centre stage where then people spoke about, you know, dad and, and, and that. And it was interesting too because there were other political leaders there and there were other plaintiffs there. And so it was really good to have those people with us to celebrate that moment. But then that moment got destroyed 
when the desecration happened. So, you know, and it was, it was so hard because it was like we just unveiled it and then the next morning it's destroyed. And so that was really hard. And then, you know, to have to exhume his body and take him back to Mario was hard again because he was too far away that we could, you know... I lived in New South Wales at the time. So to get from New South Wales right up to the Torres Strait, that was a big effort. But during that time, <coughs> we had the Air Force... The, the um, Royal Australian Air Force stepped in and said, we'll fly the family. But they all have to come to Townsville from the Air Force base there. So they had a caribou. Well, that thing can open wow. up a door and plenty of people can go inside. <laughs> so I think we took the Townsville community with us. Yeah. But hey, it was, a, it was a great thing to see. And I remember my son getting off the seat and wanting to go and to see the pilot. And I went like, this plane's going to take off. And they go, no, it's okay, he's allowed. And I sort of walked him in and I said, are you guys right with him? And they said, yep. And he just stood with his hand on the glass and watched the ground go away. And it was just, you think he would budge? No, he stayed there for that whole trip. And then um, when we went to land and then we were getting off, there were all these other planes all lined up along the airstrip at Horn Island. So we all got off one plane and get onto all these little, little teeny weeny planes. But they were, it reminded me of buzzing bees flying around the island because one would land and there would be like three still hovering around waiting for that one to take off before the next one came in. And there were like 12 planes that were bringing people across. And for me, it was that whole thing of like, yep, yeah, we're going home. And we got there before dad's body came. And then when Dad's body came, I'm washing clothes. For, I got four kids. <laughs> well, when I got up there, I ended up with ten kids. <laughs> and it's like, how did that happen? <laughs> so I'm washing all their clothes and hanging it up. On the, and Mum goes, come on, your Dad's coming. So I'm really happy going, oh, yes, Dad's coming. And I'm thinking Dad's going to walk off that plane. Yeah. You know, because I'm on Murray Island. So, yeah, mm. we're just getting ready to bring Dad home. And then we see the coffin. And I let everyone else walk with their coffin and I had waited back and thought, I'm gonna do a slow walk because it was still a little bit too hard. And then when we did get to where he was relayed, it was a bit, a bit of a bittersweet moment because we laid him out on a bamboo bed first for family who didn't make the first funeral to mourn for him. They mourned for three days and then we reburied him. And for me, what that was, was just a moving moment. And, you know, mum, again, was still inspired to keep making her T-shirts. So each year she did those. And at the 10th anniversary, she made sure she had a really nice one, really deadly one for when we went to Melbourne, because the city of Melbourne invited us down to celebrate the 10th anniversary. And they t flew the whole family down. And I went like, what? <laughs> Thinking, That's, there's a lot of us. And they said, yep, it's OK. Wow. But we all went down. We marched through the city of Melbourne. Charles, he, who's here in the audience with us, Charles Bassey, mm -hmm. his dad was with us. And you know what? He and Mum walked together, and it was a beautiful sight mm -hmm. for them walking together too. Melbourne Town Hall. It was, it was just that. Then we walked in and who's singing? Ricardo's singing. Oh. We walk in, he's singing, he been, he been. And it was like, <laughs> oh my goodness, more tears. Yeah. And Vicky, Vicky and Linda Bull are standing there and they're, they're his backup. And it's yeah. like, wow. I'm their fan. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but it was uh, the way the city of Melbourne embraced the family to celebrate that 10th anniversary yeah. was wonderful. And then we went on to do the first ever lecture that then kicked off other lectures around the country. But for me, just wearing that shirt my mother did was always something that was like, you know, that moment to be proud of. Mm. But now they're here in the, as a collection of the State Library. 
and you know, and it's that thing of like they needed a home. Mm. Yeah. So now they're home. Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous. Mm. Thanks, Gal. I, I just so appreciate how um, generous you are with the stories that you share. They're quite personal. Um, and I, I remember like being with you on the day that you donated the shirts and some other pieces and it's hard because you've they're, they're right from close to you and mm. then giving them out to the public really oh but one of the the really fantastic things as part of that collection is the Margaret Laurie book now the Margaret Laurie book is a book of myths and legends of the Torres Straits mm. the book that I donated to this space was the one Dad used in his court case. Wow. At the front of the book, he writes, this book belongs to the Marbo family and is to be returned to the Marbo family after the, Mar after the case. <laughs> E.K. Marbo. <laughs> so for me, it was, it was that thing of like, I would have loved to have kept it. But when people don't understand the value of a book, it can be damaged. So I needed to give it a home that future generations can come and see it and have a look at the markings that he put in the book to talk about the case, talk about land ownership and connection to that space. And so, yeah, it's here too. Mm. Gorgeous. I might actually take one of our questions that have come through, um, an anonymous question. Uh, it's not, you know to necessarily be anonymous for, but um, uh, the question is, can the artists talk about their favourite artwork in the exhibition, of course, other than their own work? <laughs> well, maybe I... Oh, no, we won't put pressure on Gail to <laughs> say I which one's her favourite, but... No, I like them all. I, it's a, for me, it's... it's oh. the overall, they're all fantastic. Maybe you know. a, a good question would be, what work particularly engaged you? Um, um, well, we were just looking at um, Uncle Ken Fido's work oh, yes. and we were discussing mm. that and wishing we could see the articulation happening by him. But also yeah. just the way he's painted the figure, there's something about it, everything. Yeah. I can just see, um, you know, that man standing there and mm -hmm. so proud and mm -hmm. everything else that's part of it. So I really enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, I love many, many of the works. Love Katina's beautiful work too, you know, that you. they're so delicate but sort of magical and pulling you in so mm. yeah i encourage everyone to see the show if you haven't already yes yeah. open till 8 p.m tonight um, <laughs> katina did you have a particular work that engaged um, you it's interesting that this image just came up this is obery sambo's work mm. um and i was really lucky so in my day job um as a curator next door at queensland art gallery um we just opened a show about a fortnight ago and i was really lucky to be able to work with Obery on commissioning some new works by him. And again, you know, we sat down and we did an interview and, you know, he shared some really, um, you know, really personal stories about, um, about Mer and about um, the diaries that he makes. And, um, yeah, so, I, yeah, just like to acknowledge this amazing work by Obery on the screen. Um, I thought maybe... Uh we could just think, I guess the tour is sort of coming to the end. We've got one more venue and um, I guess part of the Marbo legacy is actively decolonising Australian history in the legal sense particularly um, and in the public dialogue. Um, what do you see as contemporary arts role or artist's role and, um, and their impact in, in continuing to decolonise um, our spaces, our, our public domain? Um, I'm kind of, I guess, Katina, because you are an artist and you work for a major institution. <laughs> yeah. What do you see as the artist's role in that and how has that um, been evolving and making um, yeah. a big impact, potentially? I think that art is an excellent entry point to talk about the hardest of topics. Um, so it can disengage the viewer. It can, um, it can actually... It, I suppose art can make you take ownership of your feelings when you view something or if you have a reaction to seeing an artwork and then to learn the bigger story about it. So um, it's kind of that two-pronged approach by um, 
making people, I suppose, think critically or conceptually about what they're looking at as an art piece, but obviously needing to know the background story um, into what happens within an artwork. Um, and that's a very, um, very broad <laughs> answer, but, you know, I was trying to think about different works that have really, um, you know, taken me back or maybe stand back or just walking into a space and thinking, wow. And, you know, you're allowed to um, admire artwork for its beauty as well as its concept. And, um, yeah, so I think it's a marriage of, of, the, of that. Disarming yeah. and then engaging yeah. in, in the dialogue. Yeah. Judy, what do you think? Um, I guess, yeah, I'm kind of interested because we are sitting in a, a cultural institution that um, collects knowledge um, and curates it and archives it. And what do you think um, uh, about how our cultural institutions are changing and um, potentially where we are in that decolonisation process? Because I see that as part of this work and the, the legacy. Well, I think um, institutions can be really scary places and so... If you can try and bring people and communities in to get past that, that's sometimes where artists can do that. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sort of talking firsthand. I was pretty scared of libraries and <laughs> <laughs> all those places. But once you, you know, get past that idea, and I, so I sort of tend to fall into things and just open a book up randomly or, you know, look at something. And I... The ones that have most effect on me are the ones where I don't understand what it is, but I'm pulled into it, and that's what I try and do with my work as well. And I think that artists can supplant and change things just by tipping things up. And as artists, we don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, so we're sort of heading I into our... Sorry. Yes. Artists are allowed to say things that other people aren't allowed to say <laughs> in a public <laughs> realm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, as Gordon Hookie says, well, I'm just the artist, you know, if anybody has, you know, problems with what he does, well, they have to, you know, deal with the dealer or the, you know, the institution or whatever. And I think it's really good just to, to um, just put it... You make the work, you put it out there and you... It's the best thing is if it actually affects somebody in some way. Yuani mm -hmm. Scarce and I were just in an exhibition uh, down Plimsoll Gallery in Hobart and we had a whole lot of people coming through and later they were coming out almost weeping but really touched mm -hmm. and they also said, we can see how much care you took with what you're dealing with, you know, Yuani, you know, dealing with atomic, um, you know, British atomic explosions in Maralinga, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, um, and the effects on the community. And so it's somehow when the beauty or whatever it is within the work, it um, just surpasses what the content is and people... Mm. I talk about it, you know, swallowing swallowing the work and only then, like the work, it just goes... <laughs> was in, in, in you and then you realise later it leaks out its content. Mm. And I think film is like that, music can be like that. Mm. It gets past you. That's what you want art mm. to do to get past that sort of opposition that people mm. have to the message mm. and then they'll understand more deeply. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's gorgeous. Um, so we're sort of heading into the more formal Q&A part of the session. Um, uh, and again, if you'd like to uh, uh, ask some questions of our panel, you can go to the slido.com website and hashtag SLQ Marbo Legacy. Um, uh, so we've got a question for Gail. Um, how much consultation did you pro provide the artists while they were developing their artwork for the exhibition? Um, none. <laughs> <laughs> because of the fact that um, I wanted to see what they could do. Mm. I didn't want to give them a little box and say, you stay in your little box mm. and stay in your lane and just do that. I thought, no... Broad stroke, they can do whatever they want because it's a, it's if you give them freedom, the interpretation is is completely different to what I would have done. So mm -hmm. that's what I wanted to see was how creative they could be with the information they had. And as you can see, when you go and see the exhibition, yeah, it worked mm. by doing nothing. But yeah, 
I love that. It's a very laissez-faire curatorial yeah. approach, but it's the provocation that's, that's so it. important. Yeah. But um, we were just talking about that before, about how curators and artists, there's a level of trust. It's like this conduit between each mm. other and the curator is providing something and you have complete trust. It's like a life support system mm. and you're both balancing. Mm. And the best thing is, you know, you had that trust in yeah. us as artists and then so we also had to do something to sort of uh, try and respond to the privilege and you know the excitement of being in that position as artists as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you feel any pressure approaching the Marbo legacy? Just a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> immense, <laughs> immense. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Not sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we've got another question. Is anyone still making the T-shirts? I presume that's like in your family. Is there an ongoing tradition of the T-shirts? Mm, no. no. I do, I'm, I'm starting to do the, the different ones now and then, but no, sort of the last, the last shirt I got that was a Marble Day one was um, given to me by Paddy Mills. He, he, ah. he actually designed shirts and he took them to Murray Allen and gave them to different families to wear to celebrate the 30th anniversary. So for mm. me, that was fantastic. And, you know, to, for my sons to bring home a shirt for me was like, oh, how cool, thanks. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, so we've got another question is where, will, where else will the exhibition be toured? So Rockhampton um, Museum of Art is the next stop. Um, and that opens in October. So it's here up until October, I believe the 8th. Um, and then it heads up to Rockhampton, their beautiful new museum. Um, and that's all we've got scheduled at the moment, but there's a question here overseas. And I'm, oh, hang on, Ooh. that's a provocation. <laughs> well, show us the money, then maybe yes, that'll happen. Yes, exactly, <laughs> show us the money. that's the biggest thing, is yeah. trying to find that money. So, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there's any questions in the room. We've got some coming through on digital, but... Um, Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> We've been sitting in a room together for a while now. Come on. <laughs> nope. Gail, did oh. you have any more sort of like, I guess it's been a long journey on this. So you started at the 21st, 25th, 25th anniversary, yeah. anniversary yeah. of Marbo. We're in the 30th mm -hmm. year. You've watched the show tour and you've seen audiences engage. Yep. What are your reflections on reflections on Marbo? <laughs> the reflections that Marbo <laughs> has on Marbo? Um, well... It's just been a fantastic journey because of the fact that it's engaged with a lot of different people. People who wouldn't go into an mm -hmm. exhibition and sort of just stumble in and go, I've had people go, what the hell is this show? Mm -hmm. And it's like mm -hmm. I'm sort of standing there going like, I want to hear how the, the people mm -hmm. in the room are going to respond to this. They're going, oh, it's fantastic. You should see it. You should, you know, people are sort of trying to get them to calm down and come over and have a look at work. They're going like, but this is... Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be having works like this. And because they, they saw words on the wall that was like, to them, was offensive. So then we had to address the elephant in the room. Mm. Go, well, why, does it, why is it offensive to you? Mm. Let's talk about that. Why do you think, you know, we should take it down? Mm. You know, she had an issue with it. She came back six times with this issue. Highly engaged. <laughs> and it was like, and it was like um, so the, the fourth time she came back, I had to remove myself from the room because it was just like, lady, you're a little bit too much for me at the moment. Mm. I, can't, I can't deal with this. So I went and had a cup of tea and the other girls kept going with her. And, they, and she said, have a look at the book, read the information in the book, and then come back and have a conversation with us. Then when she did... And she came back and then she went and looked at all the works and read about each work. She calmed down. She said, I hope it's not here for long. <laughs> and the curator said, oh, it's here for another couple of months. She just scoffed and walked off. And I went like, well, OK, you got your answer. You got, you got a booklet. She bought a book. Mm. She read about the exhibition. She still didn't like it. But at the end of the day, she got a bit more knowledge about what the works were about. Mm. And she was telling people about what she saw and they turned up and they really liked it. Yeah. So, you know, from one extreme to another. 
but it is that thing of like if it's if it's something that you don't like you know mm. well maybe you have an issue with it mm. because what i saw and how the collection sat together worked brilliantly and so if words on a screen or on a artwork don't you don't like well walk away from it mm. don't let it annoy you or stand and talk about it I wonder yeah. if it yeah, has something to do with its confronting when um, privilege is um, confronted and, and there's a different occupation of space and history is told. It can, be, can invoke fear mm. and then anger, expressed as anger. That's it. Um, we've got a question here. Is, um, what do you want people to feel and experience in the exhibition, which you've sort of talked about how one person felt. Yeah. But, but it's that thing of just... Just understanding that, you know, the, the how complex my dad was because of the fact that, you know, there was... He did many things. He didn't just fight for that case. He did many things and he was an advocate in many different levels also. So, yeah, so that's just... So what you see in the exhibition is just a little in way, a little dint into his life. So, yeah. Um... Just reading these questions, excuse me. Uh, so we have a question. Actually, the show is broken up into four themes. Um, and I wonder how uh, Katina and, and Judy, how you decided to approach, like what theme you decided to approach. There was personal, there was legacy, there was I wish I had my book handy. Um, uh, yeah, what, what drew you to which part of the, the show? I'm not sure because I was drawn to many parts of it and at one stage I wanted to make work responding to um, your father's work as a gardener um, at James mm. Cook University because I taught up at uh, Townsville TAFE for quite a few, lived in Townsville for about six years and was sort of up there and I knew a lot of the people, not that well, but, you know, who he had... Um, who were advising him, you know, they were sort of Henry Reynolds and... Um, Noel Luce and others and friends of mine were studying you know at the time too and sort of history and um, all this social policy so it was something that was part of the language that I was a part of in that time and I was wanting to do something about that I also want to do something about his education but somehow the map and also the colonisation uh, process and the fact that I had done some work uh, researching my own material in the British Museum and Cambridge Museum, that's what pulled me in in the mm. end and that's what won out because I think the work has a conversation with you too and even though you might have all these ideas what you want to do, it just takes over as well mm. and just slaps you around mm. and says, okay, that's what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, I agree because it, sometimes it, it depends on what you had been working on and what train of thought you were in or mm. what kind of direction your practice is taking at that moment in time. Um, but I think I definitely had all of the themes kind of in the back of my head in, you know, doing the drawings and, um, you know, actually working with the, the porcelain and taking it to, to get fired and then it cracking and then... Mm you know, these yeah. kind of laborious process, processes that you go through or you have to go through. And, you know, at one point I was kind of sculpting into it as well and then that wasn't quite working. So, yeah, it, it's just part of that artistic process in the end. And then um, I suppose it was then up to the curators to decide which, um, which of those themes my work sat better in, but mm -hmm. also in conversation with all of the other works um, and, and what they ended up being, because I'm sure that with many of the other artists in the show, you know, we had One Direction at, at the start and it could have mm -hmm. gone down into a different theme and then it kind of changed and, um, I don't know, probably toward the... when all of the works actually arrived, that's when you can kind of start to see where they sit with each other yeah. and the mm -hmm. conversations between them and how they link and, and the themes. I don't even know which mine is in, which one, which category is in. <laughs> well, we have to look at the books. There's a book. Read the book. book. <laughs> book. <laughs> yeah, you can have it available. Thank you on that. We'll just, yeah. Answer that question. Yeah. Um, mm. On the back of that, uh, this is probably a good question that's come through. Um, 
Gail, has the artist's interpretations of your father's legacies changed your own perception of his impact? No. Ah. What it does is it's still enhance that, that mm -hmm. fact because when you look at the works all together and you, it's, it's just, like I said, you know, it's a broad brushstroke but it is still about the man and about his passion, about his drive because it had to start somewhere. And so, yeah. Gorgeous. All right. Well, I think maybe we might start to wrap up. I really want to thank um, Gail and Judy and Katina for joining us. <laughs> I feel like we've learned a little bit more and dug a bit deeper. Um, and it's been a real privilege. Um, I just want to thank uh, the interpreters tonight for su their support. Uh, as I mentioned before, the exhibition's open till 8pm tonight upstairs um, in the Philip Bacon Gallery. Uh, you can pick up one of the beautiful catalogues, which has the four themes, the four curatorial <laughs> themes in it, um, out the front. Um, and it can also be purchased online through the SLQ website. Um, really stunning catalogue and um, uh, there's yeah, some really interesting writing in there. Um, Katina has a beautiful conversation with her father about the work and developing it and their family um, history. Um, there is another legacy event coming up. Jonathan McBurney, who was a co-curator on this project, uh, will do a curatorial walkthrough on the 24th uh, at 10.30. Uh, and yeah, the exhibition's open till the 9th of October. So thank you everyone for joining us and thanks once again to our panel. Thanks, ladies. Thank you.